Gospel according to Mark today in the first chapter beginning with verse 4 through 11. Mark writes these words. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Here ends the reading of the Word. May God bless to our understanding this reading. Will you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, we come before you again on this Sunday, asking your blessing. Be with us and guide us as we have read from your holy word. And now inspire and help us as we seek to interpret it. Be with us, guide us, and protect us that the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts together might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. There's a memo. That's going to be really unfair to the people who might watch this online later. <laughs> okay, for those of you who are looking, I'm looking right at the camera right now. A piece of paper got handed to our worship leader, and I just couldn't leave it alone. So I apologize to you and you. There, I've covered my bases. <laughs> when I was in seminary, I was fortunate to study with a New Testament professor named Dr. Boring. I kid you not. His last name was spelled B-O-R-I-N-G, Boring. I also studied with a professor named Dr. Fail. Spelled F-E-I-L. The two L's are one L, I can't remember, E. And in my very first day of my very first semester, I sat in Dr. Fail's class and then my next class was with Dr. Boring, and Dr. Fail stood up and said, many of you will have a schedule that says, Fail followed by Boring. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, you're more likely to be bored by Fail and failed by Boring. <laughs> <laughs> That's how my career started in seminary. But Dr. Boring was a prominent, is, he's still alive, I don't want to say was, is a prominent New Testament scholar. And one of the concepts that he is known for was driving the point of Jesus being fully divine and fully human. Now, this is important for today's text, but to get there, I've got to take a step backwards. How many of you have ever been interviewed by a church search committee? Just a quick show of hands. <laughs> so just me. So I can tell you anything right now. No, I'm kidding, of course. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. In most church search committee interviews, please don't take notes on this for whoever might be called to be your next pastor. It's not really a great practice. At some point, the question comes up, what's your position on the doctrine of the virgin birth? I don't know why search committees are still asking this question honestly, but they do. They do it regularly. 
Nine times out of ten, without the person asking the question, having a position themselves on the doctrine of the virgin birth. Uh, but what I know is, as a pastor, you darn well better have an answer in your pocket about your position on the doctrine of the virgin birth. My answer is this. And I just saw some whispering. The doctrine of the virgin birth says and why it's important that Jesus be born to a virgin. It says nothing about what probably needs to be said, which is why it's important God experience becoming human. So my answer is, I think the miracle of God choosing not to come as a force on the clouds or as an adult ready to take over or conquer significant things in the world, but as a baby and a human to experience all of the challenges and flaws of what it means to be human is amazing, phenomenal, and incredibly important. Before Jesus, God had no first-hand knowledge of what it means to be in the human experience. And Jesus had the blessing of being able to relate as God, fully divine, right? Now we're going to come back to Dr. Boring. And as being human, fully human. And part of that is acted out in today's gospel, right? Part of that is John is baptizing people for what? In the text? Repentance of sins. Very good. You get a gold star. If I had it. And could get it to you. So why, we should ask, would Jesus be baptized? What sin was he repenting from? There's nothing original about that sin. <laughs> original sin is definitely part of the answer. The concept that by being born, we replay the acts of what took place in the removal from the Garden of Eden, that that, that creates the sin and the nature of sin. That's how childbirth happened. That needed to be cleansed, and that's certainly one popular thought and doctrine of it. But for one who is fully divine, to have to repent from somehow that side of it does not make much sense. But for one who is fully human, it makes a ton of sense. But I think there's even more here. Baptism, said by one of our founders, is an outward sign of inward grace. It is a sign of obedience. It is a sign of saying before the world and God, not only do I believe and have experienced the grace of the almighty and wonderful God, but I am willing to show the world by an outward act that all can see. I believe I am willing to submit to that which God has instructed and show signs of my obedience. As Jesus experienced being fully human, showing that act of obedience is important. It's important for us as it was important for him. And at the risk of sounding like one of those TV church or pitch men, but wait, there's more. Because the story of Jesus being baptized just by itself doesn't take on the real issue of what's going on here in Mark's accounting of the gospel. Because what Jesus is experiencing is, <laughs> yes, an act of obedience, but notice how the text flows. He, John the Baptist says, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
So hang on to that for a minute now and look at the next line of the story. The very next line, Jesus comes, he's baptized by John in the Jordan, and then verse 10 picks up and it says, And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. Now, every one of us knows the next line, You are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. But don't skip verse 10. Something significant happened there. Did you catch it? Jesus, born of the Holy Spirit, fully divine and fully human, submits before God, grants that act of, not necessarily, but possibly repentance, but more importantly, obedience, and the Holy Spirit descends upon him. Scholars spend volumes arguing about whether Jesus had the presence of the Holy Spirit in him prior to his baptism or not because of this text. Do you understand how big that is? Think about it for a minute with me. It's kind of mind-blowing. God, who becomes human has to wait for the presence of God to come back into him? Wait, what? <coughs> Here's the good news, church. Scholars can spend centuries arguing about that. And it won't change your life a bit. Right? This is one of those times where the scholars argue, and I set you up. I'll confess it. I did it. I set you up to get you thinking about something that, at the end of the day, will not change your <coughs> life one bit. Here's what might change your life, though. Because Jesus was baptized, because the Spirit descended upon him, because there was now a new indicator that in baptism... The Holy Spirit acts. And as Jesus then released the Spirit at Pentecost later, again, what we can now claim, what we now know, what we now experience, is God is willing to be present in each of us through the presence of the Holy Spirit living in us, growing, growing in us, glowing out of us, sharing God's presence that comes from us to those we need. Because Jesus experienced this, we now have the chance to be the presence of God to other people. Wow! Here's the problem. In the midst of that fully divine presence living in us, we too are still painfully and fully human, right? I had a bad week. I did. It started out okay. I made a horrible mistake on Tuesday. I communicated poorly, and it took two days to somewhat have the right conversations to heal that. Pastor? Heck yeah. Don't, don't make me go into my wife's tirade about how he's in the pastor is. <laughs> Boy, she knows. <laughs> and then I spent three days trying to find ways not only to forgive myself, but worrying about the conversations that would come. Worrying about people that would second guess my judgment, worrying about having to defend the mistake I made. And as I did, I discovered my life was dwindling. I discovered I wasn't doing the kind of ministry I could be doing because I was spending time agonizing over something that I had already asked for forgiveness for. Not only from God, but from the one I had wronged. But I hadn't let go. When we are 
so fully and so painfully human that we agonize over our errors. And every one of us has them. We miss the opportunity to shine and share that light of God. There is no real way to be thankful for what I'm about to say. There is no real way. Dick, your circumstance turned me around this week because I got to be pastor again for a minute, even if it was a 10-minute phone call. I don't think God acted on you to wake me up. I don't believe that in any way, shape, fashion, or form. But for those of you who may not know, Dick experienced something traumatic this week. He had a house fire. And my awareness of that and the chance to call him and spend some time being pastoral is what made me go, don't let your little sense of guilt keep God's light from shining through you. Dummy. <laughs> I call myself dummy a lot. I'd rather you not adopt that. <laughs> it's all the same you do. Please. Okay, occasionally. Loving. Church. When we accepted the gifts and responsibility of baptism, when we accepted the presence of God's Spirit living in us, it did not make us perfect. Don't expect it. Don't expect it of yourself. Don't expect it of others. What it did make us was humble enough to be willing to admit when we were wrong and seek to heal. And that is what happens when the Spirit lives in you. If I baptize you, I will baptize you with water. But he who is greater than me will baptize you with the blessings of the Holy Spirit. And for that, 